Today I want to continue with the foundational principles and we're going to look at an awesome doctrine. That's the doctrine of the resurrection from the dead. We're looking at the basic doctrines that are found in the book of Hebrews chapter 6 verses 1 and 2. Last week we finished with the doctrine of laying on of hands and so today we're going to look at the doctrine of the resurrection of the dead. And those of you who've got your Bible, you please turn with me to the prophet Daniel, chapter 12, the last chapter of Daniel's prophecy. Daniel, chapter 12. Praise the Lord. Why so, are you so cast down? There's so few. So many of you feel, it just feels like you've just had a really hectic week. And smile, Jesus loves you. All right, praise God. Father, we bless you for your word. We thank you, my God, that your word is a lamp unto our path. That, Father, that through your word we can discover the wonderful things that you have prepared for those who love you for those who are called by your name. And so, Lord, as we delve into your precious word, we pray that by your Spirit you'll be our instructor. My God, that you give us ears that hear and hearts that understand. Lord, give, a, give hope to the hopeless. Lord, and faith to those who are, who are in doubt. And encouragement, Lord, to those who are down and discouraged. Give me grace to teach, but above all, give us all grace to really hear. In Jesus' name, amen. Daniel chapter 12 Speaking of the end times, at that time, Michael, Michael shall stand up, and the great prince who stands watch over the sons of your people, and there shall be a time of trouble such as never was since there was a nation, even to that time. And at that time, your people shall be delivered, everyone who is found written in the book. And many of those who sleep in the dust of the earth shall awake, some to everlasting life, some to to shame and everlasting contempt. One of the principal doctrines of Judaism, biblical Judaism, is that the righteous will awake from Sheol. Sheol is the place of the dead. And they will live forever. The unrighteous will awaken to torment forever. This is a belief, a, a pivotal belief of biblical Judaism. It is found throughout Scripture, the Old Testament, that the righteous will not remain in the ground. There are many Scriptures. I just want to read another one for you in Psalm chapter 17. Psalm 17, reading verse 15. The psalmist David, in Psalm 17, 15 He says, as for me, I will see your face in righteousness. I, will, I shall be satisfied when I awake in your likeness. Interesting. David prophetically writes the psalm about a resurrection. That one day he will awake, not only to see the Lord, but he'll awaken to be like the Lord. And this is the foundation of Christianity. Christianity really is a name given by unbelievers to the followers of Jesus. When we use the word Christianity, we forget the origin of the name. Christianity is not a, relig is not a name given by believers to themselves. It was a derogatory name given by the unbelievers in Antioch for the followers of Jesus. Now, the followers of Jesus got their doctrine from the apostles who were Jewish. Christianity really is the fulfillment of biblical Judaism. It's not a new faith. Christianity is based on the promises that God made to the nation of Israel, not the land, but the promises of righteousness that would lead to everlasting life. And so this hope amongst the righteous Jews, is carried into 
Christianity, that we believe that through faith in Jesus Christ, that the righteous will once more be resurrected. Otherwise, if we don't, as Paul will write in 1 Corinthians, we are of all people the most pitiable to deny ourselves the pleasures of this life, the expression of our sin nature, just to die and to cease to exist, we would then be of all people the most pitiable and probably the most silly. If there wasn't an eternal hope, what on earth are we doing here in this hall today? We could be out boating at the Val and doing all sorts of wonderful things. But unfortunately, not all the Jews had this hope of a resurrection. There was a group called the Sadducees. You've probably heard of them. And if you turn to the New Testament book of Matthew, chapter 22, we look at an encounter that Jesus had with this sect of Jews. The Sadducees, you will see, do not believe in a resurrection at all. Matthew chapter 22, and we're going to take up our reading from verse 23. The same day the Sadducees, who say there is no resurrection, came to him and asked him, saying, Teacher, Moses said that if a man dies having no children, his brother shall marry his wife and raise up offspring for his brother. Now there were with us seven brothers. The first died after he had married, and having no offspring, left his wife to his brother. Likewise the second also, and the third, even to the seventh. And last of all the woman died. Therefore, in the resurrection, whose wife of the seven will she be? For they all had her. Jesus answered and said to them, You are mistaken, not knowing the Scriptures, nor the power of God. For in the resurrection they neither marry nor are given in marriage, but are like angels of God in heaven. But concerning the resurrection of the dead, have you not read what was spoken to you by God, saying, I am the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob. God is not the God of the dead, but of the living. So we see that the sect within Judaism called the Sadducees did not believe in a resurrection, and they didn't believe in a spirit world. How they could then believe in God is in itself a mystery. So they stuck to the Mosaic law. They led a very temperate life, or were supposed to have, just to die. And that's why they were sad, you see. <laughs> For there's no hope in the resurrection. There is no joy. Yeah, he laughs, lost, gets a joke. <laughs> ah, just kidding, Heidi. Yeah, that's why they were sad. And so they pose this hypothetical situation to Jesus using the Mosaic law, the law of succession and inheritance and the kinsman redeemer. And they said, well, a man dies and he has no offspring to inherit, to inherit his portion. So according to the law of inheritance, the next of kin, the next closest relative would be the second oldest brother, would then take the wife and take her as a wife and raise up children so that this child may inherit his late father's portion of land. And so seven in this hypothetical scenario the seven brothers all were married to this woman, and in the resurrection, they would think they were really smart. Right, so whose wife is she? Of course, Jesus says, guys, you don't understand a thing. Firstly, you don't know the Scriptures, and secondly, you don't know the power of God. In other words, you don't know the Scriptures that speak about resurrection, and you don't know the power of God that is able to raise an individual from the dead. Those were the two areas where they erred. They did not know that the Bible speaks of a resurrection. It is the hope. And God has the power to raise the dead to eternal life. In the resurrection, we will not marry. Some said, Amen. And others said, Oh dear. There's no need to marry. Marriage is ordained by God so that we can have godly offspring. 
but we will have a love that is deeper than our love for our spouses. And so there's no need for marrying in eternity. But then Jesus says, you don't know the Scriptures. Why is it that God calls himself the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob? God never says, I was the God of Abraham because he is no more. I was also, past tense, the God of Isaac because he's now chalished and gone gone to the grave. Sorry, chalish means to die in Yiddish. Just for those of you who are being called to the northern suburbs, we need to teach you some lingo. God always identifies himself as the God of Abraham who still is, the God of Isaac who still is, and the God of Jacob who still is. He never identifies himself as the God who was, past tense, There is a resurrection, and Abram, Isaac, and Jacob are very much alive, as are Stalin, Adolf Hitler, and Julius Caesar. They're just in two separate places. And that we're going to look at next week, eternal judgment. We are spirit beings. There's something that is imperative to understand. In the book of Genesis, chapter 1, verse 26, the Bible says... Well, God says, let us make man in our image and after our likeness. You and I are created in the likeness of God. Does that mean God looks like us? Absolutely not. The Father does not bear our resemblance at all. But the Father is spirit. Jesus was a spirit being. And the Holy Spirit, of course, is a spirit. And you and I are spirit beings and By virtue of that fact, we are eternal. Because we are spirit beings, like God is a spirit being, we are eternal. The angels are spirit beings. That's why when Satan fell, God couldn't just snuff him out. They couldn't cease to exist. There's no furnace called the the, the destroyer of spirits. There's a furnace that's pretty hot called the keeper of unrighteous spirits. It's called hell. But the spirit is eternal. That's why when this body dies, we don't cease to exist. All that happens is the physical dies. But the soul of man, that is man's mind, his intellect, his memory, his emotions, together with the spirit, abide forever. Now, the Sadducees had quite an influence over the early church. They were part of the Judaizers, those so-called Jews who said or professed faith in Jesus would go after the apostles to the Gentiles who believed in Jesus and they would then bring a distortion of the faith to the Gentiles and force the Gentiles to come back under law. And so a group of them landed up in Corinth after Paul departed. The thing about false teachers is they never stick around while true teachers are present. They will always come afterwards. And so, if you would turn with me to 1 Corinthians chapter 15, where the Apostle Paul has to deal with the effects of men like the Sadducees who had come into the church at Corinth and told that the Corinthians that there is no such thing as a resurrection. We're just laying a foundation, and then we're going to get into the good stuff about the resurrection. And we're going to take up from verse 12, 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verse 12. Now, if Christ is preached that he has been raised from the dead, how do some among you say that there is no resurrection of the dead? But if there is no resurrection of the dead, then Christ is not risen. Does that make sense? If nobody gets resurrected, that must include Jesus. Verse 14, And if Christ is not risen, then our preaching is vain, and your faith is also vain. I mean, what's the point? Does not Christianity exist because of the resurrection? If Jesus just died on the cross, and that was the end of the matter, and he was laid in the tomb, would you and I be saved? Correct. Because the Bible says he was delivered up because of our our transgressions, because of our sin, 
God put Jesus on the cross. But he was raised, resurrected, because of our justification. Because God accepted his sacrifice and raised him from the dead, you and I are now justified. We're not justified because of the cross. We're justified because of the resurrection. Because the resurrection is the evidence that God accepted the sacrifice. And this is what Paul is explaining. He says in verse 15, Yes, and we are found false witnesses of God, because we have testified of God that He raised up Christ, whom He did not raise up, if in fact the dead do not rise. For if the dead do not rise, then Christ is not risen. And if Christ is not risen, your faith is futile, you are still in your sins. Then also those who have fallen asleep, speaking of the, those who have died in Christ, have perished. They no longer exist. If in this life only, verse 19, we have hope in Christ, we are of all men the most pitiable. If our hope is in this life, if our faith is that if we live a, good, a righteous life, God will be with us, if that is our hope, we are most pitiable. Because being a believer is difficult. There's much persecution. There's much hardship being a believer. Our hope cannot be in this life. And so Paul now addresses the church. He's addressed the error, and now he's going to bring in the truth. And he says in verse 20, But now Christ is risen from the dead, and has become the first fruits of those who have fallen asleep. What Paul is doing now, he's drawing from the Old Testament. He's drawing from the Mosaic Law. He's now expounding one of the feasts. Now, many of you are very familiar with this feast. The Feast of First Fruits. Jesus is our first fruits. That does not mean He's our tithe. Some other, whenever you use the word first fruits, Christians start holding on to their pockets. They think we're going to start talking about tithing. No, it's got nothing to do with tithing. The first fruits was a feast that was celebrated the third day after Pesach, after Passover. Jesus, I seem to be speaking about the feast all the time. Jesus died on Passover, fulfilling the feast. He died to fulfill the feast of unleavened bread. Leaven in the Bible speaks about Sin, hypocrisy, and false doctrine. Well done. Praise God. All right, my work here is not in vain. In Christ, we are free from hypocrisy. In Christ, we are free from false doctrine. And in Christ, the power of sin has been broken over our lives. Not that we don't sin, it's that we do not live in sin. Gee, and then you have the third feast which takes place on the third day after Passover, the Feast of First Fruits. And many of you know what that feast is, but this is just for the visitors and those who not, don't really listen when I talk the first time. The Feast of First Fruits was celebrated the day after the Passover, sorry, the day after the Sabbath, which is the day after the Passover, the third day, and the Jews would go into their harvest fields, they would glean a sheaf of barley, take it to the priest who had then presented as a wave offering before the Lord. And what they were thanking God for was for the harvest. So what they were holding in their hand, that sheaf of barley, was an exact representation of what was about to be brought in. So the same DNA that was in the sheaf of barley was in the barley in the field. They were the same, one and the same. So when Jesus... On the day of his resurrection, fetches his body from the tomb, says to Mary Magdalene, Don't touch me. I've yet to ascend to my God and your God, my Father and your Father. Jesus had to be perfect as high priest, untouched by human hands. And in the Bible says, in the book of Hebrews, he went into the Holy of Holies, presented his blood, but presented himself. He didn't present himself as God. He presented himself as Man, the second Adam. The first Adam brought sin into the world. The second Adam, Romans chapter 5, brought redemption. And so Jesus goes into the Holy of Holies, not as the Son of God, 
But he kind of goes in as the son of man and presents himself as the first fruits. As I am, so shall all those be who come after me. That is the feast of first fruits. This is how it is understood by the New Testament writers over and over again. And we're going to see this from Scripture just in case you think I am talking nonsense. We need to separate the man Christ Jesus and Jesus who is the Christ. God, the Bible tells us, became flesh and dwelt amongst us. God took on the form of a man so that as a man he could pay the price for our redemption. So when Jesus walked the earth, he walked as man, even though he was perfectly God. He was perfectly God. He was no less God than the Father, but he came as man. He was tempted in every respect just as we are. He felt as we felt. He lived as we lived. He experienced as we experienced. And he died as a man, and as a man, he went before the Father and said, As I am, so shall those be who come after me. That's why Paul calls him the first fruits of those who have fallen asleep, the first fruits of those who have died. And he goes on in verse 21 of 1 Corinthians 15. For since by man came death, by man also came the resurrection of the dead. Notice that Paul refers to the man, Jesus Christ. So you see in your Bible, sometimes the Bible talks about Jesus Christ, and other times the Bible talks about Christ Jesus. How do we understand this? When the Bible talks about Jesus the Christ, Yeshua HaMashiach, it's talking about His humanity acting as our Messiah to God. So as a man, because of His sacrifice, He brings us into a relationship with God. The man Jesus, because of His sacrifice, brings us into a relationship with God. It's the man, Jesus, the Christ. But when the Bible talks about God becoming a man, it talks about Christ, Jesus. Messiah, who is God, taking the form of a man. To reconcile God to man is Christ Jesus. To reconcile man to God, the Bible calls him Jesus the Christ. It's a play on words to illustrate the ministry of Messiah. Because sin comes into the world by Adam, a man. Sin must be paid for by a man. Hence, the Bible calls him the second Adam. The second one who was created perfect. Not that Jesus was created. He came perfect. Just like the first Adam was created perfect, the second Adam, Jesus, came to earth perfect. Verse 22, For as in Adam all die, even so in Christ all shall be made alive. But each one in his own order. Christ first. Jesus is the first one to be risen from the dead. After it, those who are Christ's at His coming. The resurrection of the saints will only take place at His coming. Now let's just understand this. Does that mean when a believer dies, they go into the ground and fall asleep and they cease to exist? No. As I just shared just now, we are created in the image of God. We are spirit beings. We can't cease to exist. So the Bible tells us, and Rion just mentioned it, the Bible says that we are absent from the body and present with the Lord. When a believer dies, our spirit and our soul goes into the presence of the Father. But our body lies in the dust or in the rose garden if you've been cremated. All right, we're not... Okay, can of worms just close and put it under the pulpit. The true resurrection of the believer takes place at the Lord's second coming, which we commonly call the rapture. That is when we will be resurrected. Verse 24, Then comes the end when He delivers the kingdom to God the Father, when He puts an end to all rule and all authority and power. And He must reign till He has put all enemies under His feet. The last enemy that 
will be destroyed is death, for he has put all things under his feet. But when he says all things are put under him, it is evident that he who put all things under him is accepted. Now when all things are made subject to him, then the Son himself also be subjected to him who put all things under him, that God may be all in all. Basically, at the return of Jesus Christ, he will set up a kingdom. That kingdom will last for a thousand years. At the end of the thousand years, he will destroy Satan, throw Satan to the lake of fire, recreate the heavens and the earth, and then place the kingdom back under the Father. Verse 29, sorry, verse, yeah, verse 29 to 34 talks about those being baptized for the dead. Please, this is not a biblical doctrine. It is not a biblical doctrine. What was happening in Corinth was the Corinthians were following, some of them were following a pagan tradition. A pagan tradition that says that you can pray for the dead in the hope that they would go from torment to paradise. This was a pagan belief system. It had nothing to do with Judaism. It had nothing to do with Christianity. It was pagan. It goes back to the religion of Nimrod. And there are religions today who believe that you can pray for the dead. You can have a mass for the dead and God will take them from purgatory into heaven. The root of that is not Christian. It's not found in the Bible. The root of that is paganism. It is the religion of Nimrod. And Paul just is using what they were doing to ask them a question. If you say there's no resurrection of the dead, what are you busy with this thing for? Why are you baptizing for the dead? If you believe that the dead are dead and they cease to exist, what is this ritual that you're, going, you're doing? He's not saying it is legitimate. You understand that? He's actually making them think about what they're doing. Why are you doing this thing? All right, now I'm not trying to have a go at anybody that might be from the Catholic persuasion, but there's only one truth, it's the Bible. The most painful thing that I had to face in my life was to realize that rabbinical Judaism was wrong, that nothing in rabbinical Judaism was biblical. I had to make a choice. I was confronted with God's Word and God's truth, and I had to make an incredibly difficult decision. I had to turn my back on my culture, on my family, on everything I knew and held dear for the sake of truth. It takes a lot of courage to believe God's Word. But nonetheless, it is the only truth. Paul goes on dealing with the subject, and he's going to look at how are we raised again, and what form will we take. The artists of the Renaissance all believe that we would take on the form of these overweight little babies, be issued with a harp and a cloud. And that, that, that was their understanding of the resurrection. We'd all become these fat cherubs. Some of us are already got the fat part. The cherub is still a work in progress. But the Bible says in verse 35, but some will say, how are the dead raised up? With what body do they come? I mean, that's interesting. Are we interested in what we're going to look like? You know, this, this concept of going to heaven is so vague. We're going to go to heaven. But we don't know what we're going to do in heaven. And we actually don't know what heaven is or what heaven's about. And I think I'll, I'll teach on that one day. I'll talk to you about what the Bible says. Not just about heaven, the city, but God's purpose for eternity. So what, how will we be raised up and with what body do the resurrected come? Verse 36, foolish one, what you sow is not made alive unless it dies. And what you sow, you do not sow that body that shall be, but mere grain, perhaps wheat or some other grain. We don't sow what the crop is going to look like. Do you get that? A peach pip does not look like a peach tree. So what... Our body looks like now is not what's going to be resurrected. Some of us say, praise the Lord. If you're under 30, you, you start to scratch your head and say, that can't be a good thing. <laughs> Verse 38, but God gives it a body as he pleases, and to each seed its own body. All flesh is not the same flesh. But there's one 
flesh of men, another flesh of beasts, another flesh of fish, and another of birds. There are also celestial bodies and terrestrial bodies, but the glory of the celestial is one, and the glory of the terrestrial is another. There is one glory of the sun, another glory of the moon. Sorry, Paul is a bit long-winded. We'll get to it. And another glory of the stars, for one star differs from one star in glory. We're going to have a different resurrected body than the body we have now. He says in verse 42, So also is the resurrection of the dead. The body is sown in corruption. Our bodies are corrupted. We're corrupted by sin. But we're also corrupted by the fall. Our bodies, from the day we are born, are in the process of dying. You and I are dying. As you stand here right now, you are dying. Because your body is corrupted. And, and nobody gets really that much past 100 nowadays. This body, Paul says, is sown in corruption. But the good news is it is raised in incorruption. It's going to be raised perfect. It's going to be raised immortal. It's going to be raised in righteousness and holiness. There will be no sin in our resurrected body. No sin nature. That is something that is just amazing. To me, that's heaven in itself. Not to have this element in my being that's always warring against me. Verse 43, it is sown in dishonor. It is raised in glory. It is sown in weakness. It is raised in power. Now notice the next verse, verse 44. It is sown a natural body. It is raised a spiritual body. There's a natural body, Paul says, and there's a spiritual body. We're going to have a spiritual body with a few attachments. This is like the GTX version couple of factory fitted additions at no extra cost verse 45 and so it is written the first man Adam became a living being the last Adam became a life giving spirit however the spiritual is not first but the natural and afterward the spiritual in other words we first got to live in the natural world before we can live in the spirit we first got to take on the natural body before we can take on the spiritual body and so verse 47 the first man was made of the earth made of dust and the second man is the Lord from heaven. As was the man of dust, so also are those who are made of dust. And as is the heavenly man, so also are those who are heavenly. And as we have, been, as we have borne this image of the man of dust, we shall also bear the image of the heavenly man. So we right now have a body that's similar to Adam's. But we're going to have a body similar to Jesus. That word, the image, is the Greek word icon. Bill Gates uses it quite often. He's got a lot of icons in his program. An icon is an exact representation. That's what the word an icon means. It means an exact representation of something else. So as we are the exact representation of Adam, so we'll be the exact representation of Jesus in terms of his body, not his deity. Please, let me stress that. In terms of his physical being in terms of his character not his deity he will always be the lord of lords and the king of kings and so paul goes on and he says in verse 50 now this i say brethren that flesh and blood cannot inherit the kingdom of god this physical body can never inherit the kingdom of god we can never stand before the father in this physical body are you aware of that it's impossible because in this physical body is the sin nature. Even if we're a believer and the sin nature has been rendered powerless, it's still there. We're imperfect, so we can never stand before the Father. So we cannot go to heaven in this body. Flesh and blood cannot inherit the kingdom of God, nor does corruption, which is what we are, inherit incorruption. And then Paul goes on to this wonderful portion of Scripture that is now under attack. Behold, I tell you a mystery. We shall not all sleep, but we shall all be changed. Changed. Wonderful word in the Greek. Alasso. 
Alasu, it means to exchange one thing for another. That's the language. We are going to exchange this corrupt body. We're going to exchange this body of sin and this body of death. We're going to exchange it for what? A body like Jesus, a glorious body. But you don't have to go shop for it. The exchange will be done by God. Because it says, but we shall all be changed. We shall all exchange this fallen body for another one. And it will happen in verse 52 in an instant, in a moment, in the twinkling of an eye. When? At the last trumpet, when the Lord descends to celebrate the feast of trumpets, which is not going to happen in September. We are having a lot of wonderful signs in the heavens, which are just normal, very normal. If anything spiritual happens in September... I will resign from the ministry forever. <laughs> forever. The blood moons are just bloody nonsense. All right. In a moment, in the twinkling of an eye, at the last trumpet, for the trumpet will sound and the dead will be raised incorruptible and we shall be changed. For this corruptible must put on incorruption, this mortal must put on immortality. And when this corruptible has put on incorruption and this mortal has put on immortality, then shall be brought to pass the saying that is written, Death is swallowed up in victory. O death, where is your sting? O Hades, where is your victory? That's the resurrection. Our bodies will be changed. Those who are faithful to Jesus, those who have made in the Lord their lives, at the last trumpet, which should be happening Sometime soonish, in the next 50 years or so. But the Bible tells us we're going to have a body exactly like Jesus. In 1 John, I'll turn there if you would, 1 John chapter 3. I want us to look at this body we're going to have because it's quite incredible. 1 John chapter 3. Some of you know this, others don't. First John chapter 3. And we're going to read verses 1 and 2. Behold what manner of love the Father has bestowed on us that we should be called children of God. Saints, this is a richness that we are missing in the church. If you've been here for more than three Sundays, then you've heard it. Because I can't stop talking about this. We were not saved to go to heaven. Jesus didn't save us to go to heaven. He didn't die on a cross to wash away our sins. Does that mean our sins aren't washed away? No. What I'm saying is it was not the purpose. When Jesus came to earth, He didn't come for the sole purpose of forgiving our sins. He didn't come as Savior. He came as Redeemer. He came to restore us back to God. To make a way for God's purposes to be fulfilled. In doing so, He had to forgive our sins through His blood. So salvation is a part of redemption. But redemption is greater than salvation. He came to save us so that we can be redeemed. So that we can go from sinners, separated from God, estranged from God, sinners who are, whose only expectation was God's wrath and judgment and eternal hell. He took us from that. All who would believe, all who will bow their lives to the Lordship of Jesus, He's taken us from sinners estranged from God. And through a simple faith in Jesus, through a bind on our lives to His Lordship, we are translated from sinners to sons. From estranged to adopted. So we become the children of God. And in doing so, the Bible says we then become co-heirs of the kingdom with Jesus. So we go from charcoal to kings. 
The Bible in Revelation calls us kings and priests with God. Not kings and priests of God, but kings and priests with Jesus. Because we are co-heirs. Co-heir means to be an equal inheritor. Now, that doesn't make us gods. He's still God. He's still Lord. But He's given us a kingdom. And so John, understanding this, reminding a church that understood this. Remember, the early church knew a whole lot more than we did. And he's reminding them of truths that they knew. He says, Behold what manner of love the Father has bestowed on us that we should be called children of God. I mean, that should be all the, what's the, it's, it's just all the motivation we need to love God. To be a child of God. What a privilege. What an undeserved privilege. To be forgiven. That God will look upon me and you with love, with such acceptance, with such a desire to give you His kingdom, with such a yearning to be with you. God the Father yearns for you. That's why the psalmist says, how precious in the sight of God is the death of His saints. God can't wait for the day you die. Now, now, please, don't, don't expedite the process. Now, don't go home now and jump in front of a car or something stupid. But God yearns for you. He loves you so much that He can't wait for you to be with Him. Because He's got a kingdom to give you. And He wants to give it to you. What manner of love the Father has bestowed upon us that we should be called the children of God. I mean, that's reason to worship God. Therefore, the world does not know us. I mean, think about it. You know the people that persecute you and tell you that you're rotten, good for nothing, nobody, fool, silly, stupid, how can you believe in this Jesus? You know those people? Well, they're going to hell. If they do somehow make it through God's wrath and they make it into the millennium, guess who's going to lord over them? Yeah, you. The world doesn't know us. We look ordinary. But the Spirit of God is in us, guaranteeing that we are the sons and the daughters of the Most High God. And that there's a kingdom awaiting us. This, our, the kingdom of God is not of this earth, and the kingdom that we're going to inherit is not of this earth. We do not look for the things of this life. We look unto God and the coming kingdom. So let's go back to John. Sorry, I've left him in the wilderness. Verse 2. Beloved, now, at this point, we are children of God. And it has not yet been revealed what we shall be. But we know that when He is revealed, we shall be like Him. For we shall see Him as He is. Our relationship with God is going to change dramatically. But one thing is true. We do not know the fullness of what is going to happen in eternity. We have insights and glimpses. But the fullness of what we're going to do in eternity, our relationship with the Father in eternity, is not 100% clear. There are insights, but it's not 100% clear. But there is one thing we do know, that we know, that we know, that we know. That when He comes, we shall be like Him. So how was Jesus? Well, let's look at what He was like after the resurrection. Turn with me to Luke chapter 24. Luke chapter 24. And we're going to take up from verse 36. Context is the two disciples who are on the road to Emmaus meet up with Jesus. They didn't know it's him, but as they break bread, Jesus reveals himself to them. They are disciples, not apostles, so they weren't one of the by this time, 11. And so they report back to the comp their companions in Jerusalem, and they say in verse 36, Now as they said these things, Jesus himself stood in the midst of them. And he said to them, Peace to you. But they were terrified and frightened and supposed they had seen a spirit. I guess we would also be somewhat terrified if Jesus just appears. 
Verse 38, And he said to them, Why are you troubled? And why do doubts arise in your hearts? Behold my hands and my feet. That it is, sorry, let's read it again. Behold my hands and my feet, that it is I myself. Handle me, touch me, and see. For a spirit does not have flesh and bones as you see I have. Jesus, in his resurrected form, tells the disciples to touch him. In another gospel, Thomas had said, I won't believe unless I see him and I put my finger in the nail marks on his hands and in his side. Thomas says, I will not believe unless I can touch him. Jesus, obviously being God, heard Thomas say that. And so when he appears, he says to them, touch me. See, does the spirit have bones and flesh? Bones? Yes. Jesus has bones. He's resurrected in a human form. He's got flesh. But he's able to appear in the physical and then disappear and be in the spiritual. He can be in the physical realm and in an instant be in the spiritual realm. And he can move between the two and live, experience fully both realms. In fact, remember, Jesus was born Jewish, was crucified Jewish, and he rose again Jewish. Therefore, there were certain elements of a body that were important to Jesus, and his disciples were all Jewish. What's the good of being resurrected in a human form if you can't eat? So Jesus says to them, he invites them, to touch them. Verse 40. Unfortunately, some of you, you won't have a verse 40 in your Bible. Because many Bibles actually omit verse 40. When he had said this, he showed them his hands and his feet. But while they still did not believe for joy and marveled, he said to them, Have you any food here? So they gave him a piece of broiled fish and some honeycomb. And he took it and he ate in their presence. So this resurrected body is physical in every respect. Bones and flesh, muscle, sinew and tissue. You can eat. Jesus ate many times with his disciples after the resurrection. He had a fish fry on the, lake of Gal on the shores of Galilee. And then he could be gone in an instant and in the presence of the Father. Or if you're a Mormon, be in America. No, I'm just kidding. This is the body that we will have. One that will relate perfectly to this physical world and one that will relate perfectly to the spiritual world. Doesn't that sound exciting? I've always wanted to fly without an airplane. <laughs> Cannot inherit the kingdom. The blood, okay... Rion asks a very question, a good question. He says, earlier we read that flesh and blood cannot inherit the kingdom. Now in Luke we're seeing that Jesus is resurrected and he makes reference to his bone and his flesh, but not the blood. Understanding that the sin nature is passed through the blood. All right, so when, when Paul talks about flesh and blood, he's talking about this fallen flesh with the sin nature of Adam that courses through it, cannot inherit the kingdom. Okay, and hence a new body with new blood. If there is blood, we don't know. There might be, there could be, who knows? We don't know, so we can speculate and that's just a waste of time. We could be eating rather. <laughs> this is the glorious hope. We're not just in this world to believe on Jesus and go to heaven. There is a kingdom it's going to reign on earth for a thousand years, and then that same kingdom will reign in eternity. And the Bible calls the believers the kings and priests of God. We will reign with Jesus for a thousand years, the Bible tells us in Revelation, during the millennium reign of Christ, all of us in resurrected bodies who believe. I hope it's all of us. If it's not, that's terrible. But all of us who believe on Jesus, all of us who have given our lives to His Lordship, will rule and reign with a resurrected body, with this glorious body. 
The Bible tells us that God will give us an inheritance in the nations. So some of you might find yourself on a different continent, but then there's going to be a staff meeting in heaven. So you'll go from being on earth, ruling and reigning, and the next minute you'll be in the presence of the Father. Now that's not glorious, I don't know what is. I mean, talk about beam me up Scotty and going at warp speed and all that kind of cool stuff. This is the glorious resurrection. We're saved to be adopted as sons and daughters to receive a kingdom that the Father yearns to give us, that we will rule and reign with Him for eternity. This is the glorious hope of the resurrection. And even creation yearns for the resurrection. That's what Paul talks about in Romans 8 as we close. This will be the last scripture in Romans chapter 8, reading from verse 18. Everything in all creation is yearning for this moment when the Lord puts an end to sin and wickedness. Even creation, Paul says in verse 18 of Romans 8, For I consider that the sufferings of this present time are not worthy to be compared with the glory which shall be revealed in us. Remember we, when we spoke about baptisms, we spoke about one of the baptisms called the baptism of suffering. Despite what some people say, serving Jesus is hard. There is opposition from the world. There's a hatred from Satan toward us. But then there is God molding our character. God chastising us. At times, there's times of blessing and at times of chastising. This is a reality. It's not often shared, but it's a truth. There are sufferings as God deals with us and as there is opposition from the enemy. There are also times of great joy in the Lord. But it does not compare to the glory that will be revealed. It doesn't. Verse 19, For the earnest expectation of the creation eagerly waits for the revealing of the sons of God, for the creation was subjected to futility. Futility means pointlessness. This creation is pointless. It is warped. It is distorted. It is wicked. Jackie used to be a, a wildlife, and my wife, not, funny, not many people actually know that I have a wife and that she does sit in the church with us. <laughs> but I do. I have a very precious wife. <laughs> but Jackie worked for the Wildlife Society when we first met and we were dating, and she, she loves nature. She loves going out into the bush felt. And then she married a Jew uh, who likes air conditioning and comfort. And I, we, I'd watch wildlife programs with her because she loved watching it. And then you'd see this beautiful you know, herd of antelope in the field, minding their own business, eating the grass. The next minute, this pack of lions would come and rip the thing apart. And something about wildlife filmmakers, they love to show you the animal's throat being ripped open and the lion sticking its head in and ripping up the heart. I don't know, that's warped and sick. And I said to her, I said, there's no beauty in this. This is ugly. I, I, can't, I can't see beauty in an animal being ripped open and torn apart by another animal. I see wickedness. I see evil. I, I understand they need to eat and they, they can't go to McDonald's drive through I get it. But it's futility. There's a wickedness. There's a fallenness about creation. And so the creation, in verse 19, its earnest expectation is it eagerly waits the revealing of the sons of God, for the creation was subjected to futility, verse 20, not willingly, but because of him who subjected it in hope. Because the creation itself also will be delivered from the bondage of corruption. Notice that. This creation will be delivered from the bondage of corruption decay into the glorious liberty of the children of God. And we know that the whole creation groans and labors with birth pangs together until now. And not only they, but we also, who have the first fruits of the Spirit, even we ourselves groan within ourselves, eagerly waiting for the adoption, the redemption of our body. With creation, we want to be changed. With creation, we want to take off the sin nature. 
We don't want to live in this fallen world. How many of you are so disappointed in yourself sometimes when you do something and you know it's wrong and you, oh God, I just want to be free of this nature. Do you ever have that? But we want to be free of this body. We want to be free of this nature. We want to take on the resurrected body. And the creation itself is going to be destroyed at the end of the millennium. The Bible says that the heavens and the earth will be rolled up like a scroll. They'll be burnt with fire. And that is this, it is that scripture that tells us that there are no aliens or life on other planets. The Bible says that God is going to, the, the heavens are going to melt with a fervent, with fervent heat. And God's going to destroy all things. Can you imagine poor E.T.? I mean, he's eventually arrived home after making that long-distance phone call. You know, reunited with his mom and dad. And the next minute, the whole universe and his planet is destroyed. Why? Because hundreds of thousands of light years away, called Adam, uh, ate a piece of fruit. Uh, you know, sometimes we just think about Scripture. God's going to destroy the entire universe. Because of the sin of mankind, because of Adam's sin, has tainted the entire creation. And if there's life on other planets, God would be pretty unjust nuking them because of us. Does that make sense? All right, if you still believe in life on other planets, then you have to explain that to me. All right, any questions? It's crystal clear, isn't it? There is a blessed hope. It is for this that we continue to serve God. It is for this that we bear the shame and the reproach of Christ because we are going to inherit a kingdom and we are not going to have this same body or the same sin nature. We are going to be perfect in every respect and we will see the Father. No man has seen the Father because of the sin nature, but we will be free from the sin nature and we will see God, the Father, for who He is. And with the elders, we will cry out as we fall on our faces, holy, holy, holy. And that's just the beginning of an eternal, glorious story. Let's pray. Father, we want to thank you, my Lord, that you have filled your scriptures with this blessed hope. Lord, that the sufferings, that the hardships that we encounter on this earth are temporary, but there awaits a kingdom that you so willingly want to give us. There awaits a resurrection, my God, where we will be completely changed into the very likeness of your Son, the very first fruits from the dead. And Lord, we ask that you would keep our minds fixed on this. Lord, when the, just the, the drudgery of this life, Father, becomes unbearable, that we will be reminded that it's passing away, that this life is but a short vapor and eternity beckons where we'll be the sons of God kings and priests of the most high Lord in perfect unity with you in perfect relationship until now we until then Lord we thank you for your mercy we thank you for your grace we thank you that you never leave us nor forsake us we thank you for the Holy Spirit that cries out in our hearts of a father reaffirming our identity that we are not saved sinners but we are sons and daughters of God. Though we do sin, we there is grace and forgiveness. Lord, I pray that not one person would shrug this off, that not one person would ignore the wooing of your heart, but that all of us will bow our knees to the Lord of Jesus, that we may be spared from your wrath and receive your grace and your forgiveness in Jesus' name. Lord, your peace be upon all. Amen.